So then what is most philosophy doing? I mean, it, that's not, I don't know. <laughs> that's not, not a lot of philosophy is really grappling with the constraints, the constraints of its historical moment. I don't want to get too salty on, on here, but like. I know I always say, I feel like we always say we have a very special treat for you, but I swear this is also a great treat because we are finally doing Jean-Paul Sartre. So we decided that we wanted to read Sartre's Search for a Method, and there are about three things I want to say to help you know set up this conversation between us and for you, the listener. Search for the method to give you a bit of historical context. The best way to think about this is this is old man Sartre trying to settle accounts with his um, younger existentialist self in light of Marxism. So the way the story goes is, you know, when Sartre wrote, um, wrote Being in Nothingness, he actually hadn't read pretty much any Marx at that point. It was you know, a really strict phenomenological text dealing explicitly with more Husserl and Heidegger. And so, obviously, Sartre is the one who's thought to popularize this notion of existentialism, and he was getting critiques from the left and the right of, you know, what does this have to do with uh, materialism, with, you know, revolution, with political struggle? And so, Search for a Method is part of the, um, Sartre's longer um, social and political uh, work called Critique of Dialectical Reason. And so one way to understand what he is doing in Search for a Method is he's trying to understand is there a way of understanding a relationship between existentialism that affirms the reality of the individual and Marxism, which he thinks is the philosophy of our time? And I'm sure we'll talk a bit about what he thinks philosophy is, but he thinks that Marxism contains the elements of truth. And he's trying to, and he says rather explicitly, it's not a question of existentialism and Marxism being on the same level. It's existentialism liquidates itself into Marxism, but we have to understand how that happens. An interesting fact about Search for a Method is originally it's at the end of this really large volume, like over 600 pages of, of critique of dialectical reason. I bring that up because, you know, one, he ends up putting it in the beginning because he realized that it looks like a mountain gives birth to a mouse if he had it at the end because Search for Method is only like, you know, 90 or 100 pages. But, you know, what's important to understand with Search for a Method is Sartre thinks that this method of trying to understand what it means to totalize a situation, what it means to grasp how facts relate to one another in their, their totality, that you can't actually have the method a priori. It has to be worked out through you know, patient ex excavation, attention to um, specifics and particularity. And so a uh, critique that you know, we read that he launches is that he worries about a Marxism that, you know, the way that I put it, knows all too well what it wants to say. And so it doesn't pay attention to specific facts of a situation. It just already has the motor and it runs with it. And so search for a method, it comes at the end because he's saying it took 600 pages for me to realize what it is we need to do for Marxism that lives up to our time. And the last thing that I want to, to bring up to understand, like kind of start spirit, if you um, want to go read, sorry, to, this is the way to understand what he's always doing. Is he is really someone who wants to understand. And he worries about a thought that, you know, becomes too mechanical and doesn't actually appreciate um, concrete mediations. And so he says rather briefly, and then I'll turn it over to you all, that there was a moment where existentialism seemed necessary because Marxism had reached a standstill. And so this, he's writing this in the post-Stalinist era. And by what he means by standstill is it became too dogmatic. 
It got caught up in bureaucracy. There's a lot to say about bureaucracy and critique of dialectical reason. And so he said it no longer allowed us to know ourselves in history, to know our situation. And so he turns that existentialism as you know, at least an opening to affirm the reality of, of, his, uh, of history. And so social Methodists start trying to you know, encapsulate how do we think about the individual's relationship to history in light of Marxism without falling on either on the side of idealism or falling on the side of dogmatism. And, you know, and I think that's where we leave it. And so the, the, last, the last last thing I want to say that I really appreciate about Sartre is that Sartre is basically saying a philosophy worth its salt should give us practical knowledge. If it, if it only provides you know, slogans and dogmas, it's no longer of use to us. On the other hand, he does think that you know, it isn't arbitrary that Marxism can provide to us the truth of our situation, but he thinks that it, it's not going to do that work on its own. We have to bring it to bear on reality and then do the work what he calls totalization, which I think for him is the Galian notion of, of you know, grasping the truth of the situation. That's really good, a helpful sort of situation on overview. Um, maybe one question to ask is like, so he's writing this, what is it, the 50s, um, right, or early 60s when he's writing this? Early 60s, yeah. Early 60s. And as you said, right, he, 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 he makes this claim, and it's an interesting text, among other things, because it's sort of, you know, autobiographical. He's sort of telling the story of, you know, what we thought and how we were thinking of things and how we approached and came to Marx and so forth. Um, and it's almost, con it's almost got like a confessional mode to it. You know, there's like, you know, m ways in which he's describing, you know, when we first encountered Marx, we were like, oh, I guess that's some guy who wrote some stuff in the middle of the 20 or middle of the 1800s when he lived in London, some German dude and didn't really change us, didn't really affect us. And then when we did try to take it up, we did so in this weird idealistic mode. Um, but then he says that like, then something changes early 20th century, Marx becomes like a living thinker for them. But then as you pointed out, he says, Marxism stopped, right? It came to a standstill. It stopped. Uh, here's how he said, here's how he puts it. Marxism, after drawing us to it as the moon draws the tides, after transforming all our ideas, after liquidating the categories of our bourgeois thought, abruptly left us stranded. It did not satisfy our need to understand. In the particular situation in which we were placed, it no longer had anything new to teach us because it had come to a stop. That's at the bottom of 21. So like, I'm curious about what you all think, wh why that happened, right? What, what does that mean? For, for Marxism to have come to a stop and why that happened. I mean, there's like examples that he gives of what that looks like, where it becomes this kind of dogmatism, where it no longer is critical, uh, where, you know, you, you've got an a priori interpretation of human nature and society, and you're going to force the facts to fit it very unscientifically. But why did it come to a standstill? What was it about the situation that made it incapable of speaking to them any further, do you think? Yeah, I mean, like he he singles out the the Soviet the Soviet Union and the Soviet experience in particular as one example of the way that Marxism froze in time, as it were, and it ceased to like evolve organically and dialectically with the situations it sought to analyze. Right? He says at one point that it sought to, it basically started doing like idealist violence to facts. Yeah. Um, and trying to make like the facts of situations to make data conform with that a priori theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that, he gives that example, but he also says like in so-called quote unquote, like bourgeois societies, it also came to a standstill in the French Communist Party in intellectuals examining history. They take any particular historical event and immediately subsume it regardless of its details, right, into a... Marxist explanation, right? Like the French Revolution was a bourgeois revolution, right? You'll, I think that's part of the reason why in the critique of dialectical reason, he gives such a novel rereading of the French Revolution, tries to bring it alive in a certain way, yeah. even from within a Marxist framework, right? It wasn't just a bourgeois revolu revolution. There were these moments of genuine emancipatory group formation, um, and then they get co-opted and frozen in various different ways, but it's a complicated, messy affair, and he tries to bring that understanding of like historical totality or historical totalization into a genuinely determinate link with the real messy details of 
yeah. what history looks like as it unfolds. Um, so I think that's one of the, I mean, I just want to say also though, at the risk of going on too long here, that I think there's still something really familiar in what he, in what he reproaches in Marxist philosophy. And probably you guys or our listeners are familiar with certain kinds of Marxists, or maybe even are some of ourselves at the worst moments where it sounds like you're just subsuming things that like, everything is deja vu, deja entendu. Like you have an explanation for it. Like someone talks about a given historical fact or a given historical event, and you immediately without blinking are able to understand how it fits in with a explanatory framework, a Marxist explanatory framework. Right. And so like, and I think that has led a lot of people from different theoretical frameworks who might not even be hostile to Marxist philosophy to kind of bristle at it sometimes and to see it as a cliche and to not be as open to it as maybe they otherwise would be. So I appreciate that. Like what starts doing there, I think still speaks to the situation of Marxist philosophy today, you know? Yeah, my worst moments, I can be the type of person who's someone's just like, oh, I just broke up with my partner. I'm like, yeah, that's class exploitation for you, right? <laughs> it's just like, what? Yeah, like, what or someone you, says what something you and you're like, typical lib, typical lib <laughs> shit, you know? Like, we do that kind of stuff all, all the time, right? Like, such, such is the condition, such is the condition of alienated man under capital, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Am, yeah. Am I right, folks? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. As he says, like, there's like this way and this like very fast way of moving where like everything is perfectly clear and I've understood nothing. Right. And mm -hmm. again, there's like a confessional mm. edge to this here where he says stuff like this about himself. He's like, yeah, everything was I knew immediately of how things were. I didn't understand a single thing. Yeah. And I, I don't want to talk too much, but I think that there's something important that when I you know, said in the beginning that Sartre is someone who wants to understand, it's important to know he doesn't want to understand for understanding's sake. It's because he thinks understanding is a is a net is in a necessary relationship to practical action to bring about freedom. And so understanding, you know, he at the the very end, like you know, I guess like everyone had a problem with Blue Patch at this point. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, everyone's coming for him. You know, <laughs> Um, he takes the task Lukács saying your existentialism is still an idealism, and he has this long two-page footnote that Sartre, Sartre does that sometimes. And you know, in the footnote, he basically says, "Well, you're misunderstanding. You're, you're misunderstanding what existentialism is about. Understanding isn't simply about passive consciousness absorbing facts. It is you know throwing itself out onto objects and historical situation. And so for Sartre." You cannot engage the practical activity of freedom of changing the conditions that make Marxism necessary unless you also understand that situation, its specific contradictions and its mediations. And for, for Sartre, that isn't just immediately clear. The understanding for him is a type of struggle and elucidation, a revealing. So if it's all too clear immediately, I think you know, for Sartre, He's trying to say then that's not the practical work of the understanding of disclosing. That is just you know, probably mm -hmm. you resting on your immediate assumptions of what it must be rather than engaging with reality. Yeah, that footnote was amazing. It's footnote nine, almost at the end of the first chapter of the book on pages 32 and 33. And it's incredible. It's like a note on method, which is which is very funny in a book called Search for a Method. He's like, all right, here's the long <laughs> footnote. Let's talk about methodological principles. It's like, I thought this was whole thing was OK, whatever. But he says, you know, there's these two kind of idealist, re two forms of like idealist relapse for, you know, even Marxist thinking. You know, and as he says, like the theory of knowledge is like one of the weak links, he thinks, in mm -hmm. Marxism as he's finding it or encountering it. But what he says is what we can and should do is try to develop a theory that situates knowing in the world uh, and which determines it in its negativity, right, in its relationship to praxis as this kind of, like you say, movement of attempting to totalize and attempting to realize freedom. So I don't know. I think there's a lot, a lot here. Right. And um, I hear when I hear, you know, it att attempts to situate it. I hear this is going to be the basis for the situationists later. And also like, you know, certain forms of standpoint epistemology that want to situate who is the, the knower and what is their what is their situation? Like as an important part mm -hmm. of any attempt at constructing knowledge that has totalizing and universalizing aspirations has to situate itself. And I think this is one of the like sophisticated kind of dialectical moves that he's doing where he's always trying to hold together the individual and never lose sight of either the individual or the universal, right? He really does want both like at all times, which I think leads him to 
take head on some of the problems that, you know, are all too easily solved when everything's clear and and you think you've understood, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's like a meta ideological point here that I actually would like to understand better that kind of blows my mind. So I think it's right what he's saying that Marxism stopped for the usual reasons. But like that to me is like, an entry point for him to make this like bigger ideological criticism of like the state of philosophy in general. So like there's the fact that Marxism stops, but like before he explains that to you, what he says is that, um, so he talks about Descartes and Locke and then Kant and Hegel and then finally Marx. And he says, These three philosophies become, each in turn, the humus of every particular thought and the horizon of all culture. There is no going beyond them so long as man has not gone beyond the historical moment which they express. I have often remarked on the fact that an anti-Marxist argument is only the apparent rejuvenation of a pre-Marxist idea. Mm -hmm. And importantly, I think, that's me, my ellipses, a so-called going beyond Marxism will be at worst only a return to pre-Marxism, at best only the rediscovery of a thought already contained in the philosophy which one believes he has gone beyond. Mm -hmm. And so what he's trying to say is that Marxism stops, but it's the philosophy of our time. And therefore, Mm -hmm. every attempt to go, like when it stops, everything that happens around it is a reversion to something before it, or that is already there and that you just end up repeating it and and repeating the thing that led you to the stop. Mm. And like, Mm -hmm. I actually think this is a really deep problem um, because I I think, at least my own view, is that I think there have been very few philosophical, genuine philosophical contributions to Marxist philosophical scholarship since the 1960s. And... I think most Marxist thinking has mostly gone on in the social sciences, and that is where it has lived. And I don't think that whatever contributions are there are mostly philosophical. So I find myself, you know, I teach uh, Marxism courses, and there are weeks in which I simply have to just teach them non-philosophers and get them acquainted with debates that are just way far afield, Mm -hmm. because there's absolutely no resources for doing that directly in philosophy. This is a major ideological problem for, like, philosophy in general. And, like, he also seems to say really interesting things, like, that the other thing that was happening, pluralist realism. Oh, yeah. That oh, this was wild. He has this wild... I wonder what you guys think about that, where, like, pluralist realism is both the pre-Marxist and this going beyond idea that he was seeing happen in his own time. I actually am not sure what he means by that, but there was, like, an intuitive way in which I thought that is exactly the moment we're living in. It's just hyper-pluralist realism. I wish Mark Fisher was around so he could write a new book called (laughs) Pluralist Realism. But, like, anyway, so this, I'll, I'll shut up because I just have questions. It's, like, there is this problem about Marx, Marxism stopping, and then there's this second la- layer of ideological observing on Sartre's part that what follows that is this other stuff. And, like, I can't tell you how many times, like, I, I say this to you guys all the time, and maybe I've said this before on the podcast, but on God, the, if I hear the word go beyond one more time... <laughs> Like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's it's like this symbolic gesture that is the most vacuous thing. It never amounts to, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what the referent is. I don't know where you're going. It's bizarre. Like the it's beyond, a voluntarism and it's an idealist voluntarism, right? Yeah, I just want to thrust myself <laughs> yeah, yeah, in my exactly. own thoughts beyond, like, go ahead, Owen. No, no, I just think, I think that it's actually really helpful. It's a pause there. And I mean, even just to stop and go back, you mentioned this, Will, that Mark, that Marx, that start does think that Marxism, despite the issues that he raises, right, it is the unsurpassable philosophy of our time. And there's an apparently simple but pretty, like, I think, complex claim about what it means to do philosophy and how philosophy is related to the time in which it, it operates. Like, to go back to this point about voluntarism, right, I mean, I think to what extent, it's hard to articulate exactly how this relationship looks, because 
it's not a determinist relationship where like, oh, you have to do the philosophy of your time. The philosophy of your time is Marxism. And there's a kind of mechanistic relationship between it, like do your Marxism, because that's precisely the opposite of what he's trying to say here, which is that we need to stop mechanistically approaching Marxism. Existentialism can be helpful with that by allowing us to understand that situations are equivocal, that they, they're they not mechanically determinate, um, etc. But I don't know, maybe I just wanted us to maybe just like kind of pause on that relationship for a moment, what it means to, to moor philosophy, right, to root it, like in a particular moment without it making stuck to that moment such that you neither get the voluntarism of like, let's go beyond, let's, I, you know what, I'm done with this framework. I'm going to kind of develop a framework over here. And like <laughs> that, when you, when you, when you read Sartre and you, and you think about people saying that, I mean, it sounds absolutely insane. I mean, obviously, I mean, it has no choice. I mean, your thought is responsive to your historical moment. It can either be in a way that isn't self-conscious of that rootedness in the yeah. historical moment. Nice. And then you're just, you think you're being autonomous and sovereign as a thinker, or it can be self-conscious of that or attempts to understand better those determinations of your historical moment as you do philosophy um, and to and to work in and against that, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, so he has a really weird um, definition. Well, I, I would say weird because he gives a type of dignity to philosophy that I'm not even sure most philosophers believe in anymore. But on mm. page one, when oh, he true. says, <laughs> a philosophy is developed for the purpose of giving expression to the general movement of society. Philosophy yeah. for him, it's thought. The reason why it's rooted to its moment is that for him, Marxism came to a standstill because it was no longer grasping what the general character of the society it lived in was. Mm. And so what I think he's referring to um, with like the pluralism and all of that is for Sartre, and let, let's be very clear, like what he's trying to do in critique of dialectical reason, Sartre thinks that there is truth to history and mm -hmm. he wants to know it. And it takes him two volumes, second one that he never finished, trying to get there. Sartre never gave up on the idea of capital T truth. Now, of course, this isn't like you know, the platonic form of truth. This isn't you know, truth that's independent of our actions. But he thinks that freedom and truth in history is what philosophy needs to grasp. It can only grasp that by what he calls totalizing. And maybe the like you know, yeah. use plain language it means by totalizing is you know, grasping you know, the conditions and the contradictions of one's historical moment. Because when you grasp them, he thinks, that is the only way through actually going beyond it. You mm -hmm. cannot simply arbitrarily say, I'm done with this historical moment. You actually have <laughs> to understand your, your freedom and its contradictions and bring it to, to light the consciousness. And so it seems to me that, you know, when he's saying that, you know, um, you know, with a pluralism and all that, he's worried about this idea that, you know, there actually is no single T truth anymore. It's just little contingencies that happen here and there. There's no effort to bring some sort of unity for active subjects to understand their place in history. Mm -hmm. And for him, freedom can only come not from voluntarism, but actually understanding your engagement with what constrains you. And understand mm -hmm. that those constraints are also enabling you to engage in certain actions. But if you're not reflective, if you don't actually understand that, then there is no direction you're giving to your historical freedom. It is just you know, the worst type of spontaneity. And the same thing can be said of philosophy, right? The same constraints that you just described with respect to action also apply to philosophy, right? That you there's no option of philosophizing without the constraints of your historical moment, right? And so... You, if you just and so philosophy has to become reflective yeah. of its moment, grasp yeah. it, exactly. Exactly. absorb it, rather than deny it. So what? Time. So then, what is most philosophy doing? I mean, it, that's not. I don't know. <laughs> that's not. <laughs> not a lot of philosophy is really grappling with the constraints, <laughs> the constraints of its I historical mean. moment. I don't want to get too salty on, on here, but like, <laughs> I am saying. Like, yeah. <laughs> Owen said that. To be clear, the rest of us did not say that. I said it. Just kidding. Okay, so yeah. No, I think you're. I think you're right. I'm with you. Yeah. What is most philosophy doing? I mean, like this was one of the things that I, you know, I'll 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 name an enemy here. And there is one footnote where he's like, I can't talk about Heidegger. It's too complicated. And we're moving on. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but I felt like this about Heidegger when I when I back when I was doing like intensive work on like you know being in time and like the the lecture courses and stuff from like the the late twenties and early thirties. Like I felt like. 
I can learn this language. I can learn how mm -hmm. these, these, these concepts fit together and I can build stuff with them, but it didn't feel to me like it was that it was doing this, right. That it was responsive to the historical conditions of its own utterance, right. Of its own articulation. And at that point, it just felt like, is this just like a kind of fun kind of thought exercise? And I think a lot of philosophy feels like that. It's a good language game. It's a great language game and you can move the pieces around and see what happens when you articulate them in a slightly different way. But it's not, it doesn't seem to me to be doing this thing that I think correctly is insisting on is being vital for, you know, a philosophy worthy of the name, that it grasps the historical movement of which it is a part and a cultural expression, which is very difficult to do without lapsing back into dogmatism or idealism. But I think he's right that without it, I don't know. Yeah. Like uh, we're just making cool sounds with our mouths. <laughs> I've heard you say that before, Gil, when like something kind of momentous will happen or something really fascinating will happen, like a major event of some kind. And you're like, huh, I wonder what your frame of analysis, if you work in X, Y, or Z, I'm not going to single anyone out, <laughs> but I wonder if you're like a Heideggerian, like what, what your thinking illuminates in this situation? Like, what are you able to better understand about what's happening around you? If you happen to think in X, Y, or Z way or something, you know, like, um, I don't know. I always found that really particularly metaphysical funny. violence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> is, uh, right, the right. disaster that happened before time in time. And like, and like Marxism doesn't automatically give you explanations to things either. I mean, that starts point two, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's like really important. Yeah, and so, okay, what I actually think, you know, makes Sartre kind of anachronistic, you know, when we were talking before we started recording, we were talking about how it seems like actually the general disposition of, of the discipline is like turned against Sartre. He's a polemicist, he's simply a political thinker, but I think it's because, you know, Sartre really holds to this principle that philosophy can grasp universality. In fact, that is what it ought to do. Now, that doesn't mean it's grasped in an abstract manner, but he's saying that if we are going to understand the, the, the meaning of you know, um, our individual you know, struggle, our individual reality, it only attains meaning in light of what Sartre thinks is this universal drive towards freedom. And so it's really sometimes strange thinking about our discipline now because, you know, for Sartre, he says this as a direct quote, you know, for him, philosophy is practical. It's supposed to have a mission of, you know, of grasping and making freedom, you know, real and comprehensible for society. Facts. I, I don't think Sartre has an understanding of philosophy that's increasingly specialized, that's, yeah. you know, increasingly kind of like funneled off into like abstract and complicated little debates. I think if Sartre were alive today, he'd think, you know, if philosophy has completely lost its way, it's lost its mooring from the one mission it has, which is mm -hmm. making freedom comprehensible. And for him, it's not simply just uh, like, oh, it's not simply a language game. It's not simply a way to show off how clever you can be. And, yeah, and I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it does feel like some philosophies about how clever you can be with stacking your arguments on a minor point. And fine, like we all got to make our bread and butter. That's fine. <laughs> but, you know, what Sartre's doing with Marxism and existentialism is he's trying to think he thinks philosophy is a real vital fucking struggle. Yeah. And that's what you know why I think he has respect for for Kierkegaard, even though it's like he goes wrong, but at least you know Kierkegaard's like, you know, I'm an individual. You know, mm. I won't be simply liquidated into the Hegelian system. And then he looks at Jaspers, who's oh, like, God. you know, he's got like total yeah. contempt for Jaspers. I've never read <laughs> Jaspers, so I don't know if Sartre's being fair or not. But his critique of Jaspers is, you know, at least Kierkegaard wanted to resist simply being liquidated into a kind of idealist system of Hegelian thought. Jaspers is resisting engaging with actual historical reality. So he's like, there's something to Kierkegaard reminding us of the fleshy reality we are as human beings. And then he's like, Jaspers, what, what, what the fuck? You're just writing your diary or something? We have things to do. And, we and so like, you know, this is, you know, this is philosophy for some. It is struggle, it's material struggle, and it's intellectual struggle. Like Owen said, it's not like, you know, um, Marxism is have method, then apply. You actually have to work out the concepts in historical existence. Yeah. I mean, that one line, it's very early in the in the chapter, right, where he says every philosophy is practical, even the one which at first appears to be the most contemplative. Its method mm -hmm. is a social and political weapon. 
he like completely believes that. And I think he's right. Like there's, oh, you know, and, and in fact, it's like, you know, this is a sort of uh, a kind of truism, right? Where like every philosophy is practical. Everything is political. Even those that, especially those maybe that, that like claim not to be, that like think that they are able to escape having political and practical commitments is itself a form of having a specific kind of commitment to kind of, you know, defeatist or nihilistic one. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the thing that I, again, like he's like, like you said before, you don't get to not be historically situated. All you can do is either own that and attempt to become self-conscious about it or flee from it. Like in a way, like this is also, uh, you can feel both sides of his, his pole here, right? He's trying to do now for philosophy as, uh, and for the proletariat as these historical totalities and totalizations, what mm -hmm. he had earlier said and done for the free individual, right? Like this is, this is the difference between a, a philosophical tendency or a historical movement that is or is not in bad faith about itself it, with regard to its its freedom and its therefore responsibility with regard to its historical moment and its relation to others. I mean, do you guys think that like philosophy has on, only more recently become the way like it is? And the reason I'm asking that is like we teach people, writers, like we expect out of them this way of doing philosophy that has become like the hyper academic and specialized kind. And so like the way we learn to read figures like Plato and Descartes or who am Locke or whomever is in this way. And then we all criticize them. Of course they have these flaws and they're justifying bad political situations, hmm. but there's also like this obvious sense in which they didn't really give a shit about those kinds of criticisms of them because they knew what they were doing. Like they would have thought it was so weird that people in 2020 were like <laughs> criticizing yeah. them for so justifying true. like no <laughs> democracy in Athens. Like Plato was trying to not justify do democracy in Athens. Right. That's the whole point of the Republic. Yeah. And he would have thought it was super strange for you to be like, Oh, Got one over God on you. Over he would have been like, yeah. "The yeah. God is like, what?" Plato comes back alive, and we're like, "Did you know like, they called me an authoritarian?" And he's just like, "Oh shit, you yeah. got me." What? <laughs> and this is what I mean. So, like, I wonder, like, the way, and so I think there's always this impression I have. I mean, I've, okay, so to be fair to everybody involved, when we start learning philosophy as undergraduates, you are taught in this way, and then you do the debunking, and that feels really important because you were not taught about the debunking. But I just feel like we spend so much energy on the debunking. And in a certain sense, it's just a truism that that's what was going on. And then we go in circles where we're like, oh, but their thought is still valuable. And it's like, of course, it's still valuable. None of this is the point. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the point is that these philosophers were reflecting on their situation and they had goals and they were capturing an ethos a set of their of their times and they were justifying or it or critiquing it and they were not confused we're the ones that have made ourselves confused about what philosophy was and is so then we we we've turned it into a kind of mini academic culture war where it's like is he or isn't he racist or imperialist or whatever and it's like the problem is, is that this man didn't give a shit if you thought that because he knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine like t telling Hobbes and Locke like they were wrong or whatever. And they'd just be like, what are you talking about, bro? We won our age. We like, won. You, yeah. We won. Yeah. Like, what do you think? And, we're, and they would justify it. They would say, and we were correct. I mean, that's we the thing right. is yeah. like, they also believed in truth. They would say, and we are correct. And then like they, but, but they would have been like, by like <laughs> yeah. we we got we got the advantage we were correct in doing that and so now we have to like slip it into subversive pedagogy to convince people that philosophy is political i just think that's really strange it's a product of a certain kind of modern academy that like mm -hmm. just strikes me as you know if you don't think the way sartre does anymore then it makes sense but when you look at this and it's like the goal of the practice of doing philosophy is to capture something about its time to justify ideas to wield them you know from positions of advantage usually that's what you're doing period so then we evaluate it on that basis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think reading sorry you know there, there there are two things i want to mention that you know follow up on what you're saying they're really, they're really interesting so on the one hand and you know 
look, I love Sartre, but it's important just to say this, you know, explicitly. This is a guy who is struggling with, so what is my role in this movement for freedom as someone who is bourgeois, someone who is an intellectual? He, he is someone who did not try to hide that. Sometimes it seems like we live in a moment where everyone's of the people. Every intellectual is on the street, and, you know, they're doing, you know, urban warfare for the people. And Sartre won no intellectual life today has starts radicalism. Like he yep. put his skin in the game, but he's very, you know, certainly like, so what am I doing when I'm writing all these things? What is the writer supposed to be doing? And so it, it sometimes like seems to me, you know, when Sartre is looking at a uh, philosophy, he thinks what philosophy is supposed to do is, and he keeps capitalizing the word knowledge, which I thought was really interesting. He thinks it's supposed to contribute to structures of knowledge, mm-hmm. knowledge that can be of use. But, you know, and I see this in my students sometimes that, you know, they've either absorbed the idea, been trained in the idea that the point of philosophy is finding the weakness in other people's thinking, which isn't necessarily about producing knowledge, (laughs) is about winning some some internecine fight that it's unclear what the outcome of this is supposed to be. Or the stakes are, yeah. Or what the stakes are, what the stakes are. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's really fascinating that Sartre is like what what little the intellectual can do is to try to grasp their time and thought. And you know, it's like, you know, if, imagine starting a modern academy. And like, again, like this isn't like you don't get me. This is just saying start is a different idea of philosophy. And maybe philosophy should be open. Like we just think philosophy isn't worth that much. Or it's just like simply about these games, but he thinks philosophy has an historic role to play. And, you know, he comes into the modern academy and people are like, well, you know, actually, dang, Aristotle, is he an externalist or an internalist? And what are the <laughs> stakes of that? And, and Sartre would be like, what are you doing? For, for, what, for what need? For, for what cause? And maybe you can convince him that it, it's, it's a good cause, but I'm just like, you know, I'm using that as an example. Of you know, Sartre is playing with an idea of philosophy that he thinks has this mission to really grasp our moment in time. And so what Lillian was saying is, honestly, if that if you think that that's what philosophy is, and you're not surprised if after a historical moment has ended, you can find flaws in people's thinking. Well, that's because the moment has ended. Like yeah, they yeah. did the best that they could. In in that moment, and that doesn't mean you can't say like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to follow that path. But you could do that in order to try to, you know, understand. So how did they view that moment or what was the what were the essential contradictions in that moment? That would be interesting rather than it just being like, haha, I found out so and so is racist. And it's like, OK, yeah, I think there's there an apropos, a lot of like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's like an apropos anecdote from um, have you guys seen the Battle of Algiers, the film? Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a scene in the Battle of Algiers where the the, gen, the French general leading the kind of counterinsurrection, right, against the National Liberation Front, says uh, he's asking, I think it's a politician or a functionary or something like, what's happening back in Paris? Basically, he think things are falling apart in Algeria, and he wants to know like, what's the situation back in France, right? And and the person responds and says, Sartre wrote another article, and the general <laughs> goes and and the general goes, fuck, like, okay, that. That is to be a, like a philosopher speaking uh, in and against and through uh, your time, OG. articulating painful truths. Like, you know, yeah. who amongst Amazing. us now is alive? Yeah. That the general heard me wrote another article go, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> like, What's like, happening that, in France? Sartre wrote another article. <laughs> so, we're going to lose this one, boys. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so good. That is yeah. that's so so good. Yeah, a real one. Well, let me just okay. So I th- I want to now circle back to uh, this kind of tension or thing that I find really interesting, which is the the double claim he's making that a you know Marxism has stopped, which I think we were all like, yeah, looking around, sure feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a deceleration, if you ask me. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but then at the same time, like the the other claim that he he's continuously insisting on throughout this is that, as you as you all have pointed out, Marxism is the philosophy of our time, and that it is an unsurpassable horizon for us. And so I wanted to try to like get us to to hone in on the second this second claim. You know, why is it that Marxism he thinks is the is the unsurpassable horizon like here's just like one line where he says this mm-hmm. uh, towards the end of the chapter on 30 
he says, far from being exhausted, right? So he's trying to explain what's the character of this coming to a standstill. It's not because it's exhausted. Far from being exhausted, Marxism is still very young, almost in its infancy. Mm-hmm. It has scarcely begun to develop. It remains, yeah. therefore, the philosophy of our time. We cannot go beyond it because we have not gone beyond the circumstances which engendered it. So I got, I mean, I have like guesses here, I think, but I'm curious to hear what you all what your like sense is for why it is that Marxism specifically captures something about its historical present, its historical conditions of Genesis. That's that makes it the horizon, right? Why is it Marxism and not other philosophies that are attempting to do this or which claim to, you know, capture the spirit of its time? Why, why Marxism, I guess. He also says as soon as there will exist, I mean, this is the last line, as soon as there will exist, for everyone a margin of real freedom freedom beyond the production of life. Marxism will have lived out its span. A philosophy of freedom will take its place. But we have no means, no intellectual instrument, no concrete experience, which allows us to conceive of this freedom or of this philosophy. And I just think because I've been reading about like orthodox Marxism a bit this semester, I think that this is fundamentally a claim that Marx makes and that the orthodox tradition makes and that I think later Marxists make, like I think this is a consistent line of argument, whether or not it will live out its time or not. I think I'd be interested to know what you have to say about that. But this idea that real freedom is not possible under conditions of scarcity and until we make, we, we deploy the means that we in fact have to eliminate that scarcity, mm. it's not attainable. But because it is attainable, Marxism is a way of telling you how and why that could be. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the, the I think that's sure. like the the fundamental fundamental like anti capitalism thesis that because capitalism makes a certain kind of overcoming scarcity possible, then freedom is possible for the first time for historically first time. Yeah. in a way that in a way that is desirable to us. Like we think about this as a, a tangible thing, a horizon, a normative horizon. Having said that, I think there's probably all kinds of other things, but I feel like that's kind of a mm-hmm. core thing. Yeah. So I'll take my crack. And I think that, I think that's right. So I think what he is saying, it's, I think it's at least two things. One, it's about objective conditions that he thinks Marxism was the, was the first thought to, reveal how scarcity is not simply a natural state, but is embedded in historical human activity. And he thinks that it grasps what is essential or what is logically true about the nature of capitalism. I think the second reason is he thinks Marxism is the unsurpassable horizon that, um, as long as the, the conditions remain that you know, gave genesis to this thought is we are at a point in subjective history that the type of freedom that we would have from scarcity, we are able, and I'm, I'm kind of falling from Lillian here, we are able to want that now. And so mm. philosophy can, you know, make that, you know, um, concrete and, you know, um, make that real for us rather than, you know, abstractly thinking that, you know, ideals of freedom are historically invariant. Mm. This is start remaining rather consistent mm-hmm. that, you know, not just, you know, the objective conditions, but also the, um, the subjective uh, resources and capacities to desire and to grasp the type of freedom that's also historically situated. Mm-hmm. And until, you know, we surpass the situation, Marxism is going to be the thought that can bring the problem of objective conditions and subjective resources and the horizons together. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the things that I, I've been finding myself emphasizing with my students when I try to introduce Marx to them uh, recently is that the, the nature of the crises that arise on the basis of capitalism as a mode of production is fundamentally different than the sorts of social crises and problems that were possible in pre-capitalist modes. So that for, and the simplest example of this, right, is circling around this question of scarcity, where in, you know, under feudalism due essentially to the relatively underdeveloped state of the relations and forces of production, underproduction was the common problem, right? Like the the problem was that like, you're not capable of producing enough to meet people's needs or desires, 
Whereas in capitalism, we get like overproduction crises, right? Which is to say social crises that happen because of the inability not to produce enough, but to distribute and... to distribute properly, given the nature of production and the relations in which they, these things take place, the production mm-hmm. and distribution. That, that, that's just different. That's just not, that wouldn't have been thinkable. I'd imagine going back to like the 1400s and talking to some serf who's like, you know, working on like a feudal lord's land and being like, imagine if the problem was that there was just too much food, too many houses. Like that, like that, that <laughs> we don't even know where to put it though. That wouldn't yeah. have been, it wouldn't have been impossible to imagine that. Right. And yet mm-hmm. we've got more empty homes than homeless people in the States, just, you know, for the, the easiest and obvious, most obvious example. Right. So like, and Marxism is the thinking that explains this in a systematic way. What's historically novel about this and why it is that we ought to be organizing our, our social our social holes in a different in a fundamentally different way for the realization of something like freedom. Imagine trying to think about freedom like today and trying to say anything meaningful about it while simultaneously abstracting it away from the litany of tyrannies that we are subjected to, like the tyrannies of affordable housing or unaffordable housing of your bosses of uh, a fucking climate that's hurtling towards disaster because it is under the, the direction we take as a planet is under the tyranny of fucking capital. Right. Right. Like imagine trying to think (laughs) about freedom. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, think freedom exclusively with risk concretely with respect to all those things, but you, even at its most like abstract conceptualization, you can't pull it away from those things and expect to say anything meaningful about it, right? Mm. Yeah, I was actually just thinking something that I think is remarkable about what Sartre is trying to do with philosophy is he thinks, you know, philosophy has a duty to, at the very least, not mystify one's contemporary situation. And so yeah. um, the thing I want to say also... It's like the Hippocratic quick, Oath of, of philosophy, right? Yeah, right. First of all, do, do no harm. Do no harm. First of all, do no mystification. Do no harm in thought. I actually... Re- that's really sweet. I actually like that. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Checks out. I, I like that too. I, I hope our listeners take that one to heart because you know, especially when we think about things like you know, climate struggles and all of that, a philosopher tries to talk about freedom as if that doesn't fundamentally shape our activity, shape our future horizons, that assumes that things will just, you know, probably just remain the same, these concepts will remain stable, and we can kind of ad hoc deal with that. I think Sartre would say you're completely mystifying, you know, the, the existence, the reality of what individuals are facing in their historical moment. And what you're doing is withdrawing from them the resources by which they can understand what what the freedom requires of them. Mm. And so the real quick thing I want to say is, you know, when he's saying, you know, Marxism is the rise, and I, I have something I want to, like, be clear with our, our listeners. Again, Sartre is not just a priori saying this. So the weird thing about Search for a Method is it comes after 600 pages. So in those 600 pages, he thinks that he is starting almost like Hegel's Science of Logic. I'm just going to start. We're going to watch thought go. And yeah. you know, he thinks that when you're okay. watching, like watch the, it go. You know, um, well, just watch it go. Just watch freedom go through history. Watch its, you know, its setbacks and its successes. And he thinks this is what shows you that actually it was Marxism that provided the tools by which we could understand what was going on there. And I think that's like important to say because I think most of our listeners are probably quite warm to Marxism, but it isn't like about an arbitrary choice. Yeah. Right. It is about, you know, you know, actually a thought that put to the test does more to clarify the stakes of mm-hmm. freedom rather than mystify. And I like Kierkegaard, but imagine trying to do a Kierkegaardian reading of climate change. I mean, I mean, maybe <laughs> you could pull it off. I, I don't know how much you clarify, but, you know, yeah. you know, Sar would say, like, you can see that the tools aren't fitting. They're not, you know, giving you a coherent, yeah. um, practical whole that you are doing ideological violence to the facts and you think Marxism has the tools appropriately used to not do violence to the facts and make freedom comprehensible to us. Mm -hmm. You know, this is also, by the way, like why, I mean, we talked about this a couple of times in in a couple of different episodes, I think, but like, this is why I think someone like Sartre uh, and in other ways, maybe this ties him to, like the forms of the cool logical positivists that we liked uh, when we spoke with Liam a long time ago, that that there's something we can think of Marxism in this 
context as having something like a recognizably scientific character. Insofar as it's not supposed to be a theory that a priori you commit to in a voluntaristic way and then you find the facts that fit them, right? Mm -hmm. But which rather departs from the facts as they're given, as they're intelligible in and through the theories that are available to us and the conceptual apparatuses that we have. And in light of that, those theories and concepts get revised as a matter mm -hmm. of historical development, right? He talks about this on 26. He says, it's on the basis of the fact through the study of its lacks and its over significations that one determines by virtue of a hypothesis, the totality at the heart of which the fact will recover its truth. Thus living Marxism is heuristic. Its principles and prior knowledge appear as regulative in relation to its concrete research, right? Like it's a research program that has a scientific character because of its, its self-critical and like self-revising mm -hmm. sort of like mode, right? It doesn't, you know, this is maybe like how it becomes historical materialism over against like a Hegel, right? For whom like, I don't think that the science of logic gets differently written today if it was written today, right? Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, you so ask, either. you ask Hegel what he's doing in that book and he says, oh, I'm just like unfolding what the ideas uh, that God would have before the moment of creation are. And they're in this order. And it's like, okay, you're a lunatic. That's you're, you're breaking the minute. So badass. It okay. is very badass. I mean, like, yeah, like, no, look, I can't even dunk on Hegel. Like, yo, I'm a big fan. Yes. I'm a big <laughs> fan. But also like, you know, I think that part of what that means is that Again, if he wrote it today, 200 years later, I think that's the same book, right? Mm. Whereas a Marx who writes today 150 years later writes different shit than Capital Volumes 1 through 3, I think. And this mm -hmm. is part of what I think is important about trying to get a grip on its why it remains the horizon. And I think that it's because it, for maybe the first time, sees itself as having an essential relationship to its historical genesis and context mm. and not just an accidental one which may have been yeah. the case for previous That's philosophies. Good way putting it. Yeah, I really think Sartre understands our moment as perhaps the first moment in history where it's possible for us to not just be conscious of our own individual freedom, but also our historical freedom. But he thinks that, you know, we now have the resources, you know, we have now worked out through the struggles. We have the, the paradigm by which we can now look back on ourselves and see what freedom requires for us. Mm -hmm. Rather than, that's why I think, you know, he would say things like the Hegel and Kant moment, and what was the other one? The Cartesian moment. The Cartesian moment. He's like, those are, those are necessary moments to grasp their time. And this has now allowed us to make the break from the realm of necessity to enter to the realm of freedom. I mean, you know, one time I was talking recently with, people about Marxist philosophy and somebody asked like why does it need to go by the name Marxism like Marxism has so much baggage and so on and so forth and you know can you just get rid of the things about Marx that were bad and keep the things that are good and like if that's true then why do you need to call it Marxism and I just said like listen you absolutely can just get rid of the things that were bad and keep the things that are good like, if you don't like the labor theory of value, about which I'm ambivalent, by the way, but if you're like, wow, what a dumb idea, just let it go. The great news, the good tidings, are that, like, the dude is right about so many other things that you can just keep it moving. Because the point is to reflect the facts in the world. And, like, this is kind of what I mean about social science having sped far ahead of philosophy, is that when people stopped spinning their wheels in this kind of trapped ideological sphere and just started trying to figure out like what are people what is the ruling class doing mm -hmm. like what is the, what are labor movements doing how can we make sense of class structures formations development and so on what ended up happening is that people could still make sense of the world that way and you didn't need the labor theory of value what a gr what great news <laughs> to actually <laughs> Isn't know things great about the world. When knowledge advances. <laughs> yeah, but like, what great news you can actually know things about the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the problems with people who think about the relationship between Marx and, and philosophy is that 
we don't really think about truth anymore. So we're not like truth is bad, capital T truth. And we're, so we don't think the way Sartre thinks anymore. So we're, we actually don't have the courage of any convictions. We don't actually think we're right, which is why <laughs> you feel like you can't just let the labor theory of value, for example, go. Because yeah. if you let it go, then it seems the whole thing comes tumbling down. And like it, but it doesn't. If you actually think that the social theory is basically true, then you should just be able, like any science, to let the bad go and keep the good. And again, just keep it moving. But also, if you think it's a living philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right, but that's what, I, that's what I'm saying is that I think when you actually don't believe what you're saying, <laughs> like this is the result. Like you don't, you're not actually, you don't actually have the conviction that there's truth there. And so then you end up just like categories and so on become more important than, yeah. and I think that's what it means for it to stand still. Mm-hmm. And I think that like that's the fact that the result of that mm-hmm. is like, there is no truth at all, comrades. So <laughs> let that fly mm-hmm. by the wayside. Give you know, up. that's, yeah, that's like pluralist realism and what we already said and last thing i'll say you know building off of that this is something i find sometimes find myself frustrated because maybe it's because i don't understand what level the conversations are happening at but when engaged with marx or marxism sometimes i feel like i'm observing conversations or watching people trying to show that whatever we are talking about marx already talked about it and everything in the theory must be correct. And so there's a type of work of like trying to make a coherent whole out of a thinker's thought. But, you know, I think for, for Sartre, like, you know, the, the other kind of maybe is bad tidings, depending on how you think about it, is that he actually does think that if we enter into the realm of freedom, Marx and Marxism become obsolete. He says mm-hmm. they live out their span. Yeah. And so sometimes I'm wondering... Are we doing the work in order to serve Marxism, in order to serve Marx, in order to show, you know, how eternal they are? Hmm. Or are we doing the work so that at a certain point we think that they are right so that they can bring us to a moment where they are no longer right? To get to a situation where Marx and Marxism actually aren't the correct theory anymore. Like, actually, yeah. I feel like I'm really I'm really convinced of this. I want to get to the world where that's, that's irrelevant. It's wrong. Because yeah. it's laying out historically mm-hmm. specific constraints um, and conditions and violations that I want no longer to be in existence. But if you think it's about idealizing the thought, then it's almost as if you don't want the world to change. Nice. You just want the, the theory to remain relevant so you can keep going back and reflecting. Well, this is one of like the great paradoxes of Marx and of Marxism, right? Is that it is like toe to tip a philosophy of unfreedom and explaining the necessity of unfreedom for the sake of a freedom to come, right? That is the only reason for its for its articulation. Mm-hmm. And and it like is obsessed with anatomizing the minutia of those aspects of our social relations that make us incapable of being free. Right? Like that is, it seems to me what it is like all about in the details. No, just there definitely do seem to be people though, that want the Marxism more than the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just like, it. sometimes I just, I just feel so confused by that because again, I think for me, it's always the question. So to what end? And if the, what end is like, I just like really want to do hardcore Marxology, you know, that's what brings me joy. Then I kind of want to feel like, okay, at least I'm clear. On yeah. that. But, mm-hmm. but the Sartre search for a method, it's almost as if he's trying to bring it to the point where even he himself will be irrelevant. That, mm-hmm. you know, he himself will no longer, you know, yes. um, be a standard bearer. That, you know, I do think that there's an aspect of Sartre where he wanted to, you know, have a world in which, you know, Sartre isn't the one you look to. There isn't a general going, fuck, Sartre wrote another article. <laughs> yeah. You know, a world in which they've moved beyond the Sartrean moment. The mm-hmm. problem is we're stuck. And unfortunately, we are trying to disavow Sartre and all of this. And what we're disavowing is the fact that, you know, if we really want to move beyond it, we have to actually move with the world beyond 
be honest, so that it's no longer necessary, no longer actually relates to the facts of existence. Mm-hmm. You know what? I f- I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say that I think Sartre. I think existentialism is still a ideology for our time. Mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. what we're mostly up to these days is we're all like low key existentialists, <laughs> but then we just convince ourselves and each other that we can't use our freedom to do the things nice like i you know what i mean like everyone is like we are free and then the boys come around derrida and foucault and all the people and then they're like meh not that free like in principle (laughs) i get what you're saying actually structures structures have agency not individuals (laughs) (laughs) or structures structures have agency yeah. yeah But but no one actually goes makes the counter arguments, which is that you don't have the freedom that he says that you have. It's just mm-hmm. like making it extra complicated. Yeah. So I think that yeah. I mean, sometimes like, what would it even mean? The only way that you could have like a super mechanistically deterministic historical materialism, like I think the idea of freedom is kind of implicit in there, right? It's what, what is being blocked? What's being negated? Like, I don't think you can have, I think it's freedom that whether you admit it or not, and the desire for freedom that even illuminates a set of det- constraints and historical determinacies, like as constraints, if not, they're just, they're just like stuff. It's just like the stuff that is, and, and it yeah. doesn't need to be doubled over with articulation. It just is. So yeah. what value does it's, does its now discursive uptake have? Do you know what I mean? Like, so I think that a lot of these folks are existentialists without admitting it, right? They mm-hmm. have, and there is an existentialist irreducibility of that emancipatory desire, that desire for freedom that informs, I think, even the most like kind of jaded determinist, um, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You see, existentialism is materialist realism. Oh, there you I like go. it. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, we should. I feel like we, before we're finished, we should end with like a plea that people really should read Sartre, read Sartre seriously. I don't know. I feel like he's yes. kind of in in many different areas of philosophy has been apparently kind of discredited. I, I don't know. Maybe this is not entirely true, but in analytic circles, I feel like he's a stand-in for like the obscure French, uh, you know, artist guy who's more of a polemicist or more of a a depressing writer than someone who's actually able to illuminate philosophy, how it ought to be done for us, you know? Just chatting about Pierre at the cafe. Yeah, exactly. He's at the cafe with his espresso and cigarette. And What is he doing? Who are we? Well, and in continental circles, he's seen as like a cliche too, right? Like his, oh, look at his subjectivism, his attachment to like old fashioned ideas like truth and, you know, (laughs) subjectivity and, and, universality and like. or or they read him as a voluntarist you know adorn i'm reading these lectures from adorno on history and freedom and he just keeps beating up on sartre it's like you know yeah people talk about freedom like you can just decide to be free <clears throat> sartre. Yeah. and if you were just an adorno scholar and you might yeah. be inclined just to take adorno's word for it but i i swear like critique of dialectical reason is you know it's it's a masterpiece and, I, mm-hmm. and it's a masterpiece insofar as I think it gets a lot Agreed. right, but it's even interesting in what it might get wrong. And yeah. that's what I think is like you know, the real mark of a, a really essential thinker. You know, I said in the group chat about Lukács, you know, wrong but brilliant. Like, you mm-hmm. know, that is still important. But can, mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I, can I say, I think we can make as a promissory note to the listeners that we will at some point do episode and at least one, maybe more. On the critique of dialectical reason, this is just our first foray. Into yeah, Sartre. we're gonna have to do multiple. There's gonna have to be a number of Sartre episodes. I, I wanted to clarify that from the beginning, folks. And can I yeah. give can I give the last word to a, a little quote from Deleuze in his beautiful little obituary that he wrote uh, on the occasion of Sartre's passing? It just this, the whole thing is really wonderful. But this, there's just a couple lines here that I wanted to share with you all. He says. We speak of Sartre as though he belonged to a bygone era. Alas, we are the ones who in today's conformist moral order are bygone. At least Sartre allows us to await some future moment, a return, when thought will form again and make its totalities anew, like a power that is at once collective and private. This is why Sartre remains my teacher. 
Love it. Sark, the, what Zhuangzi calls the consummate person, Spinoza's <laughs> free man, the real one. A real one. You pick it. Yeah, yeah. you it pick is. it. <laughs> the dog, yeah. The dog, the OG. Pro Sartre is based. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> based. King. Based Sartre. All of based it. Based Sartre. <laughs> All right. New episodes of What's Left of Philosophy, they come out every two weeks. Um, as you will notice, they will now come out on Mondays rather than Fridays, um, wherever you get your podcasts. Before closing out today, we'd like to take a minute to thank some of the people who are supporting the show on Patreon. We couldn't do this without you, and we're really grateful. Today's new patrons are Bingus, Lily Hugh, Chris Myers, Gregory Flores, Dennis Sullivan, GF, Ian Lau, Robert Bacon, Kamel Streck, Matt Hutchinson, Elizabeth Pickard, Jake Coffey, Ben Horse, Lizzie Crumtiris, Martin Spears, Chronicler, Thomas Hatcher, Zach Batante, Lizzo Masters, and Kirka Perkerke. Thank you all very much. If you too like what we are doing and want to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash left of philosophy. Follow us on Twitter at Left of Phil. And don't forget to leave us good reviews and comments on your half podcast app. Yeah, let's get those reviews going. And we'll talk to you next time. Yes, as Owen said, get the reviews going. (laughs) We need to let the people know that you have great things to say about us. Uh, Bye-bye. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.